Thank you, Pastor, for the very kind introduction. And as I shared this morning in our early service, I'm most delighted to be here to partner with Sister Jessie and the Hope Ministry. This is a wonderful Sabbath, and I love the energy and the resourcefulness and the camaraderie and the deep-seated commitment that so many have shared uh, with Hope Ministry. And I'm honored that you just allow me to be the part, to be a part of this. This is tremendous. And I think you have an outstanding theme in terms of our combined efforts, all of our combined effort, efforts adding up to reach those who are lost or disenfranchised or marginalized by culture. We often reference them as the forgotten. So thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this wonderful, outstanding ministry. And I think the Lord will continue to bless. Thank you, Jesse, for fitting me into your schedule. Uh, the underlying issue is the reason Jesse invites me every year is because she wants money. And because I love her, she gets it. I'm going to make sure that continues, and we certainly value and appreciate. Jesse, I'm serious. I love you, and that's not the reason you call me. I think you call me here because you love me. You tell me you love me all the time. But when you talk about me behind my back, what you say is, I love him because he's my man that gives money. Okay, so... Uh, so Jesse is just an outstanding servant of the Lord, and I'm on. And listen, I want to be used by God, and I don't mind being used by Jesse. Okay, so thank you. We are so honored to be here, and really delighted to see each of you. I so many friends I have. I won't take the time, but Pastor Rose, I'm very honored by partnership and collegiality, and your your pastoral staff. I met all of the pastors. Just amazing. And I'm happy to be here to share this morning's two services with you. I've got a unique message that I believe corroborates with your theme for this year. And the message is entitled, Sanctuary, Sacrifice, and Fire. Our scripture text, Leviticus chapter 6 Verses 12 and 13 declares, And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out, and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and lay the burnt offering in order upon it, that he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings, the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Sacrifice, sanctuary, and fire. For the next few moments, Heavenly Father, it is our deep desire that you will take absolute control Speak words of peace, power, and exhortation to our hearts, we beg. We honor those who participate with all of their hearts in Sabbath worship, but particularly on this Sabbath, honoring an outstanding ministry that we call Hope Ministry. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart not be mine, but may they be yours. And may this worship experience with the spoken word be acceptable in your sight. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, tell the story of the relationship between a broken-hearted God and sinful humans. Somewhere in a crescent we call fertile, and in a garden we call Eden, God began to respond to incredible sin with an incredible love. You know the story. 
in the book of Genesis, the story of a God who formed man with his own hands. You know the story of a God who breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. You know the story of a God who provided a garden with fruit and the story of a God who gave to man everything he needed. God gave man dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. God gave man every herb bearing seed and every tree yielding seed. God gave man a woman to be his companion and helper and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. God said, you can have it all. You have dominion over everything you see from east to west, from north to south. Everything I have is yours. I have only one stipulation. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, you know the rest of the saga of Eve and the serpent, of temptation's power and of innocence and paradise loss. After humankind sinned and fell from God's grace, the God-human relationship was never the same. Because of sin, the divine contract established in Eden was aborted. That is why the Pentateuch, that's the five books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, that's why the Pentateuch tells the story of the relationship between a broken-hearted God and sinful man. God's response to humankind's disobedience could have been punitive, but it was not. Although God banished Adam and Eve from the garden, the glory of the story is that despite their sin, he persistently pursued humankind. This God who had been affront affronted was ever in search of an instrument of reconciliation. This God whose eyes were forever cast on a reprobate and unrepentant creation stood in the vortex of human history with the word of forgiveness on his lips and restoration in his heart. This God who sorrowfully sensed the awful work of sin was forever determined to make amazing grace available to humankind. It seems strange that he who made the covenant and did not break it, nevertheless, sought to reestablish it. It seems peculiar that he who wrote the contract and kept it was forever in search of the one who broke it. Amazingly, God was determined to repair the breach, heal the wound, overcome the separation, close the chasm, renew the contract, and settle the old account. This God of the Genesis narrative repeatedly made covenants, first with Adam, then with Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David. Over and over again, the covenant was broken. So greatly was the covenant broken that the prophet Jeremiah accused Israel of an endemic wickedness, of being a degenerate plant, backsliding and playing the harlot. So greatly was the covenant broken that when all the charges had been brought against the nation, Isaiah, wanting to convene a court of eternity, cried out to Israel, come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. This God of the Genesis narrative, who with sorrow in his eyes, banished man from the garden, 
is the same God who placed a flaming sword at the east end of the garden to point the way home for wayward humankind. This God of Genesis is the same God of John's revelation who with hopeful expectancy declared from the far reaches of heaven, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. This is an amazing story of how God continued to love, pursue, and reconcile humankind to himself in spite of their persistent disobedience and defiance. It continues in the book of Exodus during the wilderness wanderings of the children of Israel. There you will find that in the midst of their sin, in the midst of God's liberating them from their long night of bondage and oppression, in the midst of their incredible journey from a land of slavery to a land of freedom, God spoke these words to Moses. Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. I need you to understand something as we look at this sanctuary. God didn't just want any old tabernacle. God gave very precise specifications for how his portable sanctuary was to be built and described the quality of construction materials required. Everything about the sanctuary was to be first class and five star. You can be sure that when God built his church, there was nothing cheap or chintzy about it. God used the finest wood gold, bronze, and silver. He was so meticulous that no detail was left to chance or debate. God specified the reason the tabernacle should be built. And he didn't decide it in a business meeting. He declared unequivocally that I may dwell among them. His vision for the tabernacle was one that human eyes cannot see and human minds cannot comprehend. There were five accessories on the altar, all of which were made of brass and copper. Listen carefully, the pans were used to carry out the ashes. The shovels, which were used for picking up the ashes and tending the fire. The basins, which held the blood of the sacrificial animal. The flesh books, which were used for keeping the sacrifice in the middle of the fire so that it could be totally consumed, and the fire pans which were used to carry fire from the brazen altar to the altar of incense in the Holy of Holies. The fire that was brought before the Lord's presence could only be taken from the gold-covered altar of incense. Ladies and gentlemen, it's important this afternoon to understand the significance of both the sacrifice that was placed on the altar and the fire that burned on the altar. We talked about sanctuary. Let me say a word about sacrifice. Sacrifice has several implications. First, for Israel, sacrifice signified a costly religion. When people come to offer sacrifices, they did not bring the worst they had. They brought the best. They brought the finest of the flock, a lamb that had neither spot nor blemish. Whatever they bought for the sacrifice cost them something. Put more in my monitors, please, so I could hear myself. They, had, they did not approach the altar to give little. They approached to give as much as they possibly could. Ladies and gentlemen, there is something wrong with a religion that does not cost anything. Hear me this afternoon. There is something wrong with a religion that does not cost anything. But sacrifice is more than a matter of cost. The children of Israel also took seriously their obligation to God. 
Their sacrifice then signified a serious religion. When Israel built the tabernacle, they built it with the architectural splendor that God required. They used the finest materials available. When they arrived at the temple, put more on my monitors last time I'll ask. When they arrived at the temple, they went through the fence and then through the door. Once they got through the door, they stood face to face with the altar of sacrifice, where the first thing they saw was the blood. Like Israel, the first thing we ought to look for when we enter into the house of the Lord should be something serious. Listen carefully. You shouldn't look for your friends or check to see which choir is singing or which preacher is preaching. Don't look to see if your name is printed a certain way in the worship order. When you enter the house of the Lord, you need to look for something serious. You ought to look for something that reminds you that the only reason you're there is because blood has been shed. Now, that's serious. You ought to look for something that reminds you that somebody died that you might live. Now, that's serious. You need to look for something that reminds you that your sin is ever before you. Something that reminds you that the reason you're alive is not because you're holy or because you're free from sin, but because you need to stand before the Almighty to repent of your sin. Now, that's serious. When the children of Israel came to the tabernacle, the first thing they saw was the place of sacrifice, a symbol of the seriousness of their religion. Thirdly, the sacrifice on the brazen altar symbolized authentic worship. We know that the children of Israel brought animals with them to the tabernacle to be sacrificed, and that sacrifice was the first order of business in worship. Worship was not really worship unless the act of sacrifice took place. The story of Abraham and Isaac found in Genesis 22 will help this concept come alive for you. The Bible says, and it came to pass after these things that God did test Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell you of. Understand what was happening here, folk. Abraham was more than 100 years old. And Isaac was the son he had been waiting for his entire life. Yet, God ordered Abraham to take his only son to the altar of sacrifice. Technician, watch me. Look at me, th technician. Give me more on these monitors, please. Thank you. It seemed impossible that Abraham could have another son. Hagar was gone. Sarah was somewhere saying, don't even look at me. I'm done. Nothing could have been more costly or serious to Abraham and Sarah than the sacrifice of their son. The significance of this story lies in Genesis 22, 5, which says, Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come unto you again. Abraham understood that his sacrifice was an act of worship. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot approach God in worship unless you bring something with you. More than that, whatever you bring ought to cost you something. It is only when you bring something to the experience of worship that costs you something that God is honored by your seriousness. My worship is not just about my singing, and I love the singing. My worship is not just about praying or going through liturgical motions. My worship is about bringing something to God that is so pivotal to my being that when I give it up, I don't know how in the world I'm going to make it. I must give God my all. You know, when I think about what God had to go through to get me where I am, to where I am, when I couldn't do anything for myself, I refuse to give God leftovers. I'm going to give him the best I have. I need you to understand that sacrifice is significant in one more way. Sacrifice symbolizes the blessing you need when you need it. 
Let's delve a little deeper into Abraham's story. God told Abraham to take Isaac to the altar of sacrifice. Abraham was so caught up in the worship experience that he was willing to give God his only son. Yet, as soon as Abraham put Isaac on the altar and with tears in his eyes, stretched him out, picked up the knife, and prepared to slit his throat, God provided Abraham, or he provided a ram in the bush for Abraham, and that ram was just what Abraham needed when he needed it. God will give you what you need when you need it. God always have a ram. He always has a ram in the thicket. You know, the act of sacrifice activates your blessing. As soon as you act with seriousness, God puts angels into action. As soon as you act in obedience to God's word, God sends ambassadors to come to your aid. As soon as you step out by faith, God sends legions to your rescue. When you look back over your life, you'll see that God has been putting rams in your bush for a long time. God has been putting blessings in your path just when you need them most. God is always by your side just when you need him most. He always makes a way out of no way just when you need him most. When you're broke, God gives you full measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over just when you need him most. When you can't pay your bills, you've seen him open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing just when you need it most. That's why bringing a sacrifice is an important part of your worshipful approach to God. Now, even though you're not required to bring any lambs and goats, you must willingly bring something with you when you come to worship. Now, as many scrapes and scraps as the Lord has brought you through, approach God's throne while willingly bringing all you are and have. Now, please don't think, please don't think for a moment that merely bringing things to God constitutes a sufficient sacrifice. God doesn't want things. The real sacrifice God wants is you. God didn't really want Isaac. He wanted Abraham. God didn't want the goats and the sheep that the children of Israel laid on the altar. God wanted them. And God wants you too. When I contemplate heaven's sacrifice and the plan of redemption, the Bible seems to speak of something that God will do. From the foundations of the earth when God was planning this whole salvation exercise, if man fails the great test of human freedom, God had a plan to work that thing out for us. I read that all through the scriptures. He shall break the yoke. He shall redeem them from their deceit. You know, as I look at this thing, there seems to have been a tension between God's holiness and God's love. It seems to have been a contest between God's justice and God's law. I don't really know how to describe it. That what was holy in him and despised evil made demands upon him. But what was tender in him and about which the prophet said, I've loved them with an everlasting love made other demands upon him. I think I pick up that note in the Old Testament when it speaks again and again of some high cost of some expensive price of some great sacrifice as if some great contingency plan or some disaster relief procedure just in case of the collapse of the human undertaking occurs God has a plan and I found out it's not a willy-nilly knee-jerk plan the Apostle Paul sends his trembling thoughts out into the mysterious regions of eternity where earthly vegetation does not grow and human life 
does not breathe. And he uses august and mysterious words that send a chill up my spine. Foreordained, predestined from the foundation of the world, echoing the word from the revelation of a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Paul brings it home. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And your margin, it says, which is your reasonable worship. Yet there is more than sacrifice. There's more than sanctuary. There's something called fire. Look at the role that the fire played in the sacrificial process. Five accessories were used, I told you, at the altar, one of which was a fire pen used to carry fire from the brazen altar to the altar of incense in the Holy of Holies. Carrying the fire to the altar of incense was the final step in the act of sacrifice. The process of sacrifice was never complete without the presence of fire. Fire was needed in the tabernacle for at least three reasons. First, fire served as God's cleansing agent. In authentic worship, God's power is there to cleanse. When I sacrifice my life before the throne of God, God's presence cleanses me. His grace purifies me. When I come to him stained by the filth of this world, I need God to clean me up on the inside and clean me up on the outside. His holy fire cleanses. Well, the second reason fire was needed in the tabernacle was that it symbolized uncontrollable energy. Fire is distinctive in that it has the capacity to burn everywhere it goes. For example, on the day of Pentecost, the church caught on hallowed fire. When the Holy Ghost descended, the church caught on fire. Fire has so much energy that when combustion takes place, it doesn't just set one thing on fire, it sets everything around it on fire. When you approach God with your sacrifice, and as a result of that sacrifice, you get blessed, a little fire starts in you. Sometimes you try to hold on to your fire. In fact, you might even try to pretend you don't even have any fire. But sooner or later, the fire begins to burn and you just can't keep it to yourself. And once you start burning, you can't help but set ablaze everything you touch. What am I talking about? When God heals you, when God provides for you, when God delivers you from an embarrassing dilemma, the fire of God's presence makes you want to holler and throw up both your hands. You've got to tell it when the church of God catches the uncontainable, energetic fire of God's presence. Cocaine epidemics will be cleaned up. Cancers will be cured. A COVID pandemic will be contained. Caste, classism, crooked cops, and racism will be confiscated from our contemporary culture. Fire! is needed in the United States of America. Well, the third and final reason for the presence of fire in the tabernacle is that it represented the continuing presence of God. Watch this. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. It is the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night unto morning. And the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning. And lay the burnt offering in order upon it. And he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. I need you to understand the ever burning fire on the altar was a sign to the children of Israel, so that whenever they came through the gate or door, they would know 
that God was present. Ladies and gentlemen, last weekend, the Lord gave me the privilege of seeing 192 people baptized in a three-week meeting. I saw that God was present. When I approached the throne of God in worship, I too want to know even symbolically that God is present. I don't want to approach worship if the fire is out. After all, I've been battered and buffeted all week long. When I come into the presence of the Lord, I want to know that the fire is still burning. I want to know that God is present. When I walk through the door of a church building, something on the inside of me will know that God is alive, active, and available in my life. It was the priest's role, listen, to assure that the fire was always burning. No self-respecting pastor, no self-respecting priest would ever let the fire go out. So as the priest of the Southern Union Tabernacle, I have decided that no matter what, we ought to keep the fire burning. I started this campaign, and I just declared, if no visitors show up to my series, keep the fire burning. If the budget is short or limited, as long as you stand up behind that desk in Jesus' name, keep the fire burning. If those who promise to help you don't show up, as long as God is with you, keep the fire burning. If the praise team is tone deaf, don't cringe. Keep the fire burning. Somebody's dying of cancer. Somebody's dying of COVID or debilitating disease. Keep the fire burning. Somebody's heart has been broken in a thousand pieces and needs the assuring presence of God. Keep the fire burning. Somebody's child is strung out on opiates and cocaine. We've got to keep the fire burning. Women and children have been battered and bruised. Keep the fire burning. Men's dignity and self-esteem have been destroyed. Keep the fire burning. Homes and marriages are in trouble. Keep the fire burning. Families are grieving over hundreds of thousands who succumb to warfare and COVID-related deaths. Keep the fire burning. Folks dressed up on the outside are crying on the inside. Keep the fire burning. The fire burning is not the only object of the lesson to be learned here. The Old Testament tells a story of the relationship between a brokenhearted and loving God with a sinful covenant-breaking people. In order to repair the breach, to heal the wound, to overcome the separation, to close the chasm, and restore the relationship. A sacrifice had to be made. I better get some music so I can sit down because I feel my help coming on right now. The sacrifice of bulls and goats was not enough. Yet, a blood sacrifice had to be made because the Bible already declared without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sins. And because the sacrifice of bulls and goats could not atone for humankind's sin, a council was called in the throne room. Where's my musician? I need him at the keyboard. Just come on and let's wrap this thing up because if you don't come, I'm going to keep preaching until 4 o'clock. A council was called in the throne room. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Long meter is great. A council was called in the throne room of God to find someone who could, who could leave heaven and go to earth to atone for humankind's sin. Who could provide the sacrifice that, was, that man needed and that God required? Noah couldn't go because he was somewhere drunk. Abraham couldn't go because he was a known liar. Moses couldn't go because he still had blood on his hands. Jacob couldn't go because he was known as a deceiver and a cheat. David couldn't go because he still had Bathsheba's perfume on his sheets. 
Job couldn't go because he still had sores from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. Samson couldn't go because he had a fresh haircut. Jonah couldn't go because he was still in the belly of a great fish. Isaiah couldn't go because he was caught up with King Uzziah. Jeremiah couldn't go because they couldn't count on the reliability of a crybaby. But staring at the right hand of the Father, Jesus stepped up and declared, I'll go, and he went down in his divinity, but arrived in his humanity. Many don't understand all the fuss about Jesus because he was just a common man. He came to earth as a common baby. He was delivered to a virgin in a common stable. He was birthed in a common village. He was wrapped in common clothes. He was placed in a common manger. He was reared as a common carpenter. And the common people heard him gladly. He ate with common sinners. He preached from a common boat. He rode on a common mule. He washed common feet. He broke common bread. He was tried for a common crime. He was treated like a common thief. He became a common lamb. He died a common death. He was placed in a common grave. On the third day, Jesus rose from the dead, but there was nothing common about that. He got up with all power in his hand. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So he's the perfect sacrifice. In conclusion, I've got to ask, what is Jesus after all? Is he just a neurologist who heals people who had strokes like me when I couldn't walk? Is he just a speech therapist when you can't walk or, or talk? What is he? Is he just a good passenger when you've got a sinking boat? Is he just a grocer when you've got some hungry folk? I'm glad he's all of that, but thank God he's more. When you don't have a job, he's the best employment agent in the universe. When you don't have a friend, he's the best friend you could ever find. When you don't have a job, he's the best employment agent. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, when you mess up and you can't show your face because you've done something embarrassing, I've got news for you. He's a robe to cover your shame. He's Adam's redeemed. He's Abraham's sacrifice. He's Isaac's hope. He's Jeremiah's bones of fire. He's Amos's justice. He's Hosea's love. He's Micah's mercy. He's Esther's determination. He's my bread when I'm hungry. He's my water when I'm thirsty. When I get down to my last dime, he steps right in on time. Somebody has said he's my sacrifice. He's my priest, pleading for my atonement. He's my Shekinah that lights the dark way. He's the veil through which I reach God. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the Savior for any sinner who wants salvation. He's intercessor supreme. He's mediator, redeemer, restorer, the fairest of 10,000, the one altogether lovely. He's my sanctuary, my sacrifice, and he's also my fire. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to declare this carpet it's not an ordinary carpet in church, and it is nice. Goes with the decor in here. But I want to declare it as an urgent care center. Somebody's going to get fixed today. That's God's prescription. That's not Ron Smith's prescription. 
Where's my little napkin? Did I put it in my pocket here? I got happy while I was preaching. I need that little napkin. <laughs> if you love Jesus, stand to your feet right now if you love him. If you love Jesus, just stand. And as our group, just if you can just sing that song slowly for me. I don't want to change the script. I know you probably have something in your heart. Can you try, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus? Can we just give that a shot? Just sing it the way you want to sing it. And I tell you right now, folk, there are some people here today who are ill. I know that. Somebody came stumbling in here today, and, and despite the pain and the hardship or even the diagnosis. Thank you for that. Thank you. You came to church today because you need the power of God to liberate you, to unleash your healing. I don't know what the diagnosis or the prognosis is. I don't know. Maybe you're praying for yourself. Perhaps you're praying for a child. Maybe you're praying for your spouse or a parent. Just want you to slip out of your seat and just come on down. I want to pray for you today. Just grab someone you love by the hand and come on down to the urgent care center. A healing is going to take place. You're carrying a child in your heart. You're carrying yourself. You need to be liberated by the power of God. Come on, Yolanda, stand by me, will you? Thank you. Thus saith the Lord. Everybody's singing, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. How I trust him. How I trust him. How I've proven him. Precious Jesus. Oh, for grace. Oh, for grace to trust him. My second appeal there's somebody who's having some serious financial woes. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a business enterprise. Maybe it's a need for tuition. I don't know. It's not coming together yet. And you needed to come together. You needed to come fast. You need God to move in your direction right away. Maybe it's an employment situation. I don't know. Maybe you need something surrounding housing or transportation. Maybe you just need to get a noose off your neck financially. You need the power of God to fix that thing. Or maybe you're praying for somebody else. So if you walk down, you could be praying for anybody. But I want you to come to the urgent care center and bring that concern to him right now. You want to take that business to the next level. Everybody's singing, Jesus, Jesus. Precious Jesus. Oh, for grace. Somebody today is praying for the power of God in a relationship. It might be on the home front. It might be in the workplace. It might be in the church. It might be in the market square. It might be on the playground. It might be in the schoolhouse. A relationship needs to get fixed. An employer and employee, you want that thing to come together. God can reestablish intimacy. He can reestablish commitment to making it. Everybody's singing now. Just come on out. Just come on down to the urgent care center. Jesus, Jesus. I trust, I trust him. How I prove of him. Jesus, Jesus. Precious Jesus. Oh, for grace. To trust him more. My final appeal. If for somebody here who has a monkey on their back, what am I talking about? A nagging problem that just will not go away. I don't know if it's an addiction, a destructive relationship, an intergenerational challenge that you're facing, a curse of some sort, just can't break free. God is saying, if the Son therefore makes you free, you will be free today. If you believe God can get that monkey off your back, that noose off your neck, 
step out and just walk on down. To, just press in. Jesus, everybody singing. Jesus, how I prove it. How I Jesus, Jesus. Precious Jesus. Oh, for grace. Let's sing that chorus one more time. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. To everybody, call his name. Jesus, how I trust him. How I prove him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. I need to pray for you now. Heavenly Father, I followed your instructions, Lord. I invited men and women, boys and girls, to the urgent care center today. So here we are, Lord. We invited men and women with medical ailments, physical ailments, illnesses. Maybe they carried a child or a parent or a loved one in their hearts today. Oh, God, we are here representing people we love as well as ourselves. I don't know, Lord, if it's a diagnosis hematologically. Maybe it's lupus. Maybe it's sickle cell. I don't know. Maybe it's an oncological issue. A cancer somewhere in the body. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, exercise your power to heal, we beg. Lord, maybe it's something neurological. Maybe somebody's recovering from a head injury episode, maybe a stroke of some sort. Maybe there's a cardiological challenge here. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, exercise your healing power in an uncommon manner. Oh God, here we are, we brought our sick. Lord, it doesn't matter what the genre of our illness might be, you are a healer. Lord, you healed demoniacs. You cleansed them. There was a man crippled for 38 years. You enabled him to walk in an instant. There was a woman with a hematological problem for 12 long years. You touched her, and you healed her completely. Oh, God, right now, touch somebody who's sick. The blood work has come back revelatory of a problem. The doc diagnosis or prognosis is not favorable, and we need help. We're praying for our loved one or praying for ourselves to be healed. And then, Lord, there's somebody here who's struggling on a business frontier. Yes, Lord, we look the part like all is well, but we know behind the scenes there are some challenges, and you know them. Oh, God, I pray in a very special way that you will rain down manna from heaven if necessary. Anoint somebody's mailbox or inbox with some good news. Allow a call to come through, O Lord, that's revelatory that you've intervened. Oh God, I pray that you will fix business and financial issues. And then, Lord, I'm praying for relationships now. Husband to wife, parent to child, superior to subordinate, in the marketplace, in the workplace, in the church. Lord, wherever people exist and coexist and mingle, I pray that you will build and rebuild relationship. Give us Olive Branch Ministries, the ability to say, I'm sorry. Let's try again. Reestablish intimacy. Strengthen our communication and enable us to heal our relationships. And then, Lord, there are some strongholds, those hard-to-break habits, those monkeys on our backs. Lord, sometimes we feel like that we're chained and fettered. And oh God, I pray right now that you will break every chain. You said if the sun shall set us free, we can be free. Oh God, you know what the issues are. We're praying for somebody who's trapped in adverse and apathy, trapped by sin and selfishness, trapped by a debilitating disorder, trapped 
by a relationship, trapped by a substance, trapped by alcohol. Lord, closet problems that we have that trap us. We need to be free. We claim it now, Lord, that you will set us free. So, Lord, here we are. We brought our sick. We brought our financially embattled. We brought our relationships. And we brought our strongholds. And now, oh God, in the name of Jesus, we pray that you will stretch your overshadowing palm over this group today and give us the desires of our hearts and the things that we pray for. We followed your instructions. We stand, as it were, in this urgent care center. And now, Lord, we claim, we believe that we're going to get heaven's immediate attention. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, don't go back to your seats yet. The Bible says we've got to ask, we've got to believe, and we've got to claim. So I'm going to ask you first and foremost, if you would raise your hand, just stretch it to heaven. If you don't have rotator cuff injuries, just stretch it to heaven right now. And repeat after me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It is done in Jesus' name. Oh, let's give the Lord a round of applause right now. And I'm going to ask you to find the person that is closest to you and give them a very safe Christian COVID-free hug and let them know it's going to be all right. Just sing us in one more time. Jesus, Jesus, how I... Jesus, Jesus. today. Were you blessed today? Praise God. We thank God for the Word. We thank God for the preacher who is faithful to the Word. I want to remind you as you're going that we reconvene at 6 this evening. I want to invite you to be part of that. God bless you as you go, as is our custom. You're, you're welcome to sing with a praise team as they sing out. God bless you. Thank you.